welcome to another episode of Chax Chat. Join Chad Chilius and me, Dax Castro, where each week we wax poetic about document accessibility topics, tips, and the struggle of remediation and compliance. So sit back, grab your favorite mug of whatever, and let's get started. Welcome, everyone. Today's podcast is sponsored by Tamin Inc., a full-service accessibility and technology practice TAMIN partners with organizations of all sizes to shift mindsets and empower people. Wherever you are on your inclusive journey, TAMIN's team can help you with web accessibility assessments and accessible digital solutions. TAMIN believes that access to information is a human right, so head on over to TAMINinc.com to get more information. My name is Chad Chilius. I'm an Adobe Certified Instructor as well as Director of Training Solutions and Principal at Chax Training and Consulting. And my name is Dax Castro. I'm Director of Media Productions here at Chax Training and Consulting. And Chad and I are both certified as Accessible Document Specialists. And if you'd like your certification, head on over to accessibilityassociation.org slash certification and get yours today. How you doing, Chad? I'm doing well. It's a rainy, gloomy day here in the Northeast. Uh, oh. And it looks like it's going to be that way for a couple of days. But it looks like Thursday it's going to break and hopefully the sun's going to come out again. It has been sunny for a couple of days, so I have been able to work on my koi pond. So for the up the, the koi pond talk for everyone, for those who've been following, um, my koi pond is now no longer leaking. And so I have spent the last month and a half and lots more money than I wish to admit uh, chasing this leak and I have solved it. And so uh, the next thing is just uh, buttoning up some of the plumbing that's on the exterior and getting that all squared away. I bought this new air filter that's super quiet. And so um, like tail end stages, man, reveal party is coming. All right. Soon. All right. Yeah. We're going to have a koi pond party at Dax's house. Exactly. Koi awesome. pond reveal. Awesome. Well, listen, uh, we have an exciting guest uh, on the podcast today. Uh, we have Eve Hill who is a disability rights attorney and consultant at Brown, Goldstein, and Levy. And the reason that we're really excited about having Eve on today is because, you know, Dax and I will often, you know, kind of have a cursory discussion about like the legal ramifications of your your website or your documents not being accessible. But today we have somebody who is actually knowledgeable on this topic and we're really excited to to talk to her. Uh, Eve, welcome to the podcast. Great. Happy to be here. It's so awesome to have you here today. Chad and I often talk, you know, we'll we'll talk about the the legal requirements, but you know, we're not lawyers and matter of fact we joke and we say uh, I'm not a lawyer, but I play one on the podcast <laughs> and uh, so it's so nice to actually have someone who is an actual lawyer. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what you do in relation to um, accessibility in the uh, you know in this world? Well, I'm a, an ADA lawyer and consultant, so I both enforce the Americans with Disabilities Act and Section 508 and Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, and I uh, help companies, uh, businesses, state and local governments to comply, to do implement good practices so that they result in compliance. And I do that across a, a wide array of contexts. So I was just saying I, I have a case regarding blind prisoners right now, as well as a case against the Veterans Administration for not serving homeless vets. But I also do oh. it in the digital space. So we also work a lot on case, both cases and helping as a consultant that are about websites and other technology that needs to be accessible to people with dis disabilities, mostly people with print disabilities, but also people with hearing disabilities. So I do a lot of both litigation and consulting, helping helping entities uh, do the right thing. Eve, one of the things that I think a lot of people are struggling with is usually the accessibility department in a, in a company is one or two people in a large organization. In fact, I used to work for an organization that had 50,000 people in it, and our accessibility department was three people. And uh, as you might, uh, you know, under, understand that, um, that sometimes is a big struggle for us because when we're trying to convince 
others in our organization to make our content accessible, there's a lot of pushback. Yeah. And so my 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 question to you would be, um, what do how do you start that conversation in a realistic way to tell your supervisors kind of what they could be in for if in fact they do get sued? Right. Well, the first part of the conversation is, don't you want all the customers who want your service? So it's not just about the lawsuit, and that's not necessarily the reason to make your website accessible. You should make your website accessible because you want customers. And accessibility helps not just customers with disabilities, but it makes better websites and better documents that, that everybody can use. So that's the reason to do it. The secondary reason, and I don't mind if you do it because of the lawsuit, is the lawsuit. So you can get sued and you can lose under the Americans with Disabilities Act. And that can cost you money and customers and reputation. And that's a really bad situation to be put in. So um, that's how I start the conversation. First, it's the right thing. There are millions and millions and millions of people with disabilities and their families and friends who care about these issues. And and if if you don't know whether your website is accessible, it isn't. And we will know that it's not accessible (laughs) because it's not hard to figure out. So then the question becomes, well, what resources do we dedicate to that? And you need expertise. You need an office with with expertise, but you also need to build accessibility into all your development. All your content creators should know how to make a document accessible. That's where the rubber really meets the road is when you create the first document or when you create the first web page. That person needs to know how to make it accessible. It ain't hard. It's it's a doable thing, but you need to know to do it, and then you need to actually do it. And so you need expertise for the complicated stuff in your accessibility office, and then you need the basics distributed throughout your content creators, and then you need a voice from the, hot, the C-suite saying, this is important. I want it done. It needs to be done, and I'm monitoring and checking it so I will know if it's not done. Buying from the top chat is so important, right? Oh, it's super important. I mean, you know, what what we run into a lot, uh, what Dax and I run into is there's typically a couple of core people within the organization that see the value in in doing this work. Yeah, yeah. The the people who are are boots on the ground, they, they understand this, they know that it's important but they can't get the higher ups to, to see the value of why they should spend money on this, why they should invest time and energy into this. And, you know, uh, Dax and I are often brought in to speak to those C-suite executives to explain to them like, Hey guys, this is why it's important for you guys to be accessible, whether it's a, you know, and I kind of want websites and documents into the same category because one typically leads to the other, right? You know, if if you want to make your website accessible, the documents on that website need to be accessible too. Right. Um, So um, what what I wanted to know from you, Eve, is when you talk about – so Dax and I, you'll often hear us say that some accessibility is better than no accessibility. And so I'm really curious – the, the lawsuits that you see, is it because they're not fully compliant or is it because their website has egregious problems with it that, that inherently make the website inaccessible? Both things happen. So it's okay. important when you're, uh, when you're remediating a website that's not accessible that you focus on the things that people most need. Why do they come to your website? Make sure those are the things that you prioritize first. Then you want to achieve across the board compliance. You can get sued either way because you're failing. The the standard is effective communication. Your communications with people with disabilities need to be just as effective as your communications with people without disabilities. And to do that, you need to make your website accessible according to the web content accessibility guidelines. 2.0, 2.1 now, level AA. But in order to get to that, you want, you know, you can't do it immediately or necessarily overnight. So you want to prioritize the things that are most important. Why are people coming to your website? What are they trying to get there? Make sure that they can get through the user way, get through what a user would want to use on your website, and then focus on the less important things later. 
but do focus on them because you can get sued for technical noncompliance as well as compliance that noncompliance that really hurts people. And what I always advise folks is have a way to avoid a demand letter. You don't want the only way that someone can communicate an error to you or a problem to you to be through a demand letter. You want to have an email address that is actually monitored right. and responded to so the person can say, hey, I can't do this. I need to get this done. And then you can fix it and avoid a demand letter. So those are really important things. Well, you know, it's interesting that um, we, we tell people, or at least I tell people that uh, a an accessibility statement on your website goes a long way to be yeah. able to say, these are the things that we know we're doing right. Here are some things that we're working on. And by the way, here's a way to contact us if there's something else that we missed. Because right. like you said, that that's that doesn't immediately knee jerk reaction a lawsuit. Someone's going to say, "Oh, hey, there's this keyboard trap in your pop up for whatever you know," um, and and you can take care of it. But without that, uh, at least a "Hey, we're working on this" kind of statement. Right. It's um, really then, it, it encourages patience. If you yes. know that you have accessibility problems and you're working on them and you're transparent about the fact that you're working on them, it encourages me to be patient with you. Because if you yes. don't have an accessibility statement and I know your website's not accessible, I assume you don't know and you don't care. Right. Well, so let's talk through the steps, right? So we're talking about the, the kind of this thing. So the the first thing that you can do to to help kind of mitigate or or reduce the the possibility of a lawsuit is to to address what we call born accessibility, putting things the accessible components in as you develop them. But you get to a certain point you put an accessibility statement on your website, you monitor an email or form some communication, right? But that doesn't work. And for some reason, you get the demand letter. Is that typically the first step? Let's walk through the steps of yeah. what it looks like for someone get going through the process of, of this uh, uh, litigation. Once a lawyer gets involved, the first step is usually a demand letter. Sometimes the first le step is a complaint in court. So not everybody sends a demand letter. And that's okay. the best practice for lawyers to send a demand letter because sometimes you can resolve things without having to go to court. So I generally send a demand letter. Um, that's your first warning. That's your first shot across the bow, if you like, to say, look, there's a problem here. I've gotten a lawyer involved. I want this fixed. This is a real priority. And that's your first, well, actually, hopefully your second opportunity to actually make the fixes that you need. So uh, the, what you want to be able to do if you're in really good shape is to respond to that demand letter by saying, thank you for bringing this to our attention. Here's our plan. We already have a plan in progress. We just haven't gotten to the thing that you're complaining about yet. So here's our plan. And that'll, that'll again, encourage patients. And it'll also move the things that they're complaining about up on your priority list so you can get to those things early. If you don't already have a plan, then you're in a much more difficult situation and you need to respond by saying, here's the plan we're going to use and and mm. get and have that be a real plan. So you want to bring in your consultants at that point to say, how are we going to do this? How are we going to get this done and how quickly can we get it done? Dragging your feet on it is not going to help that that does not encourage patients on the behalf of the blind person or the person with a hearing disability. Um, so you want, ideally you want to be able to respond to, here's the plan we already have. If you don't have that, then you want to be able to respond with, here's the plan we just came up with, with bringing in consultants to do, but you'll need to respond quickly. By the time you get a demand letter, the patience is, is drawing thin and people are ready to file. Um, so the next step after that, if you don't get an agreement. So at that point, once you get a demand letter, you're probably going to have to enter into an agreement with this person. It's no longer uh -huh. an informal thing. You've got a lawyer involved. You're going to have to have a settlement agreement with them. You may have to pay their attorney's fees some money. You may, depending on what state you're in, have to pay the blind or, or, or deaf person uh, some damages. Those are, they're not huge damages. They're not huge attorney's fees, but you, but you may have to pay them because they invested, they had to come to this, to this, they had to come this far to get your right. Basically. Right. The next step is the complaint in court. Okay. So the next step is you, you actually go to court. 
right? right. And then and then you let the the legal system you know do its thing. Um, in that demand letter, Eve, do you typically like give them a period of time to comply? In the demand letter, we generally give them a period of time to respond to us with what their with what their response is. They may say, "No, we don't care about disability accessibility. Go ahead and sue us." That response comes. Believe it or D- not, does it really? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. We they wow. may respond that they're they need more time to get a plan together. They may respond that hey, they have a plan and they want to talk to us about it. So there are a bunch of different responses, and sometimes they do respond, we don't care, go away. I, I, I dare you to file suit, basically. Wow. that's do, I, do you, I would never imagine that's that would be a response. Oh, know. it is. Do you, like, do you like those, Eve? I like that. Do you Make like when they say, clear. I, I was just going to say, go ahead, that has got to be awesome, man. <laughs> You're like, okay, let's, let's throw down, right? Yeah, yeah. okay. I don't feel bad about this at all. <laughs> Yeah, now things are going to get fun, right? Um, so, so that's really interesting. And, and so, so you first give them a period of time to respond, and and, and what's what is that typically? Two weeks, a, yeah, a, a month? Weeks. Uh, you, couple, okay, a couple of weeks. of weeks. So they got a couple of weeks to respond, and and hopefully, right? I mean, what what for for all of the parties involved, the hope is that they respond and say say, yes, you're right. We know about this. We're actively working on it. And we're hoping to get this resolved in, you know, and I know development. Three months, you know, probably. Yeah, right? d- development timelines are, are very, they're, they're not like, oh, we'll get it done in two days, right? right. They, typically with development, they're like, oh, it's going to take us three months to get this resolved. Um, and, and so I guess at that point, you guys could choose to, to say, okay, that's acceptable, Right. Or no, that's not acceptable. Right. Because, I mean, for, if we're talking about like a consumer website and the, and the person is trying to purchase an item, it could be a car, it could be a, a boat, it could be a, a widget. Right. It doesn't really matter what it is, but they're trying to purchase this and they've now encountered this roadblock. And so so if they say it's going to take us three months to resolve this, well, now they got to wait three months to be able to buy the thing that they're trying to purchase, right? And and I guess that my question my question is like how acceptable is that, right? I mean, um I, I can say like for most of us, it's not acceptable. Like if I'm on a website trying to buy your thing and I can't buy that thing, I, I don't know that I'm willing to wait three months for that. So right. I'm just curious, you know, how how does that how does that work? How does that play out? Well Generally, we recognize that you can't reverse time, and so that that it does take a little time to make the things accessible. How much time we're willing to to give you depends on how important the thing is that the client is trying to access. Is it medical care? You don't have three months. You better you got to get that worked out now. Um, is it you know vaccine appointments for the COVID vaccine during the pandemic? That was really important. You can't wait a long time to yeah. get that get your act together on that. Um, so it depends, but did I, was I trying to buy a pair of jeans? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take the hit. I'll wait for that or I'll get it another way. I got to believe as a company, if someone tries to, if, if I'm going through this process and you say, you can't get this or buy this on my website, I'm going to get on the phone with you and we're going to make it yeah, happen. It I out. am going to get you, I'm going to get you this product. I know that there is a, uh, we were at, um, uh, John Slayton Access U conference in yeah. Texas, and someone had brought up the fact that they had bought a Samsung washer and dryer, and that because the interface is very digital, um, they couldn't operate it because the screens told you what to do, and and there was no tactile interface. Right. Someone from Japan flew to this person's what? house <laughs> and applied the tactile, tactile stickers. Markers on wow. and then made sure that the person understood how to use it. I mean, you know, wow. and to me that's impressive and shows yeah. a level of detail that, you know, that is uh, or a level of caring, I guess, that really um uh makes makes it important. In fact, we have Samsung washer and dryers uh, <laughs> when I was choose and, and you know what this is actually a really interesting point. I picked, I could pick any washer and dryer I wanted. I didn't really have a major budget. I had a big, pretty big price range. 
I picked the Samsung ones because of that story. Yeah, that's and I don't have a disability, nervous. and and I'm not. I, I don't. Well, I have a disability. I have ADHD, but I don't have one that requires the tactile interfaces. But because that company cared, it influenced my decision to buy two thousand right. dollars worth of washer and dryer. So <laughs> you know, it does matter. Yeah, the goodwill effects of accessibility and of just good customer service are are immeasurable. And being open, really, your first response has to be, thank you for bringing this to our attention. We're on it. You know, it, it's funny because we, uh, I was, uh, I was at a, a barber and I was getting my hair cut and I was talking to him about what I did. And he, and I said, we were talking about Instagram and, you know, what, how would a blind, you know, I said, well, think about this. If you're on Instagram and you're blind, how do you know what the images are? He goes, blind people go on Instagram. Why would they do that? <laughs> And, and, and it reminded me of a story I told him, I said, you know, there was a lawsuit where a guy sued a car company because their website was inaccessible. And the question from the car company was, why do, why does a blind person need to buy a car anyway? And so we had a long conversation about safety features and color and, you know, the, the, all of the things that are not, can I see the car and drive it, you know, that really still make a person, whether you're a male, female, whatever you are, as a person who wants to purchase a car, it's not just because you're the head of the household or because you're the one paying the money. It's everyone should be able to understand and, and know what it is that you're getting into and trusting your life with as you roll down the freeway right. 60 miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Right. So let me ask you in Canada, they have AODA yeah. and AODA requires that everyone, if your company has more than 50 employees, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, if your company has more than 50 employees, um, you're required to make all your content, uh, web, web content accessible, regardless of whether it's um, public or private or whatever. Do you feel that that wave is eventually going to make its way to the United States? I do, because websites don't really uh, pay much attention to borders. Um, and so the expectation is out there that all content on the web will be accessible. And people are not going to put up with it anymore. Blind people are not going to put up with it anymore. Deaf people are not going to put up with it anymore. Uh, they're, number one, going to go to your competitors, but they're, number two, going to file lawsuits against you. The there are the the um, most recent figures indicated there were like ninety six percent of of the top websites are have in, have accessibility barriers an average of fifty right. something barriers per per homepage that's ridiculous and it's getting yeah. worse instead of better so the patience has run very thin on being willing to accept a second class citizenship on the web. Now, now, Eve, when, when we were talking before uh, the podcast here, you brought something up and, and, and it was something that I was not really aware of. Uh, you had said that the ADA applies to everyone. Private businesses. Right. So, so, so are, private businesses. Yeah. Okay. There are 12 categories of private businesses that it applies to, but it's most everything. Any retail business is covered. Hotels. Uh, transportation, all kinds of businesses are covered under the ADA, and they have the obligation to provide effective communication with people with disabilities, including vision disabilities and hearing disabilities. So if you're communicating to the public with your website, that website needs to communicate to people with disabilities, which means it has to be accessible. And that's there. The only uh, defenses to that are that it's an undue burden, meaning it would be too expensive to do in light of all your resources. So you don't. It's not just in light of your accessibility budget. Uh, it's in light of all your resources. And the other uh, defense is that it would be a fundamental alteration. There's almost nothing in a website that would be a fundamental alteration to make accessible. So that's that's sort of a lost cause if you're aiming on uh, relying on that. But undue burden, I'm very skeptical of undue burden uh, defenses. People will say, oh, it's too expensive. It's too expensive. And I, and I say it wouldn't have cost you anything if you'd done it right the first time. It is not right, my right. fault. You built an inaccessible website and now have to pay money to fix it. Well, and I guess that's a bit of a hard pill to swallow. Like if you're a $12 billion company and you're saying that it's too expensive to make your website accessible. Yeah, I'm not buying like, that at all. Uh, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a tough one. 
Well, let's take an example that I actually received an email. I think it was last year. So we run a PDF accessibility Facebook group. It has about 40, almost 4,400 members in it. And wow. occasionally we get, yeah. And we, I started it in 2016, at the end of 2016, and it's grown immensely. It's a really great group. Um, but I got a, I received an, a, a, a instant message from someone who said, I just joined your group. I'm a veterinarian. And one of my clients asked to, to make my home care uh, documentation for their animal accessible. Right. I didn't understand what this was. I found your group and what am I, am I supposed to be doing this? What do I, you know, am I required? I didn't think I was. And, and we had the conversation of, well, this applies mostly to government organizations, but also you're trying to serve your customers and these are your customers so it would be the right thing to do um i wasn't really thinking about ada with the you mentioned there's a specific section in ada or a specific uh title three um, title three that's title what three i was thinking covers about. title three and title two covers state and local governments gotcha uh, so what would you say to her to this person who says i've got 150 pdfs in my in my in my cadre of care that I hand out to people about caring for their rabbit or their dog or their cat or whatever. Um, and I'm only making, you know, two or $300,000 a year in my practice. It, it, does that, how does that play into undue burden? I, I'm yeah. just curious your thoughts. Well, all those documents probably start out as a word document, keep it as a word right. document and you've pretty much covered it. You're really pretty accessible. <laughs> So give them the word version in an email and then their screen reader will be able to use it most likely. If you've got things that you don't have the original word version of and you've got a PDF, then you can remediate it. You know, re remediating a PDF is not rocket science. It can be done. You can get somebody to do it. And it's really important. I think we know a few guys. We, you know, we know a couple of guys who, who can do that, right? <laughs> and it's really important. These are the home care instructions for taking care of your pet. This is not uh, this is not a frivolous request. This is I need to know. And you, the veterinarian, give these to people for a reason, because you want them to, to right. follow these instructions. So you want your blind and, and hearing impaired customer to follow these instructions, too. And, and I mean, in that example you gave, Dax, I mean, a veterinarian, I got to believe that they've got a fair number of seeing eye dogs. Right. So. That there, that there's a good chance that that your your customer base, there could be a fair number of people who who are in fact you know visually impaired, um, and and doing doing some like quick math, you know, you you had said Dax like you know they have 150 PDFs on their website, right? Um, assuming they're like one pagers, you're talking about like two thousand dollars to have all those documents remediated. And sure. for a veterinarian, that's not like a, a huge amount of money to, to spend on that. If they're two pagers, you're looking at $4,000. So, you know, it, it's not like it's like, the, you know, we were talking about like undue burden, right? right. That's not a overly ridiculous expense for uh, a business to have to incur to, to ensure, you know, that they make their documents accessible. So one other question I have, it, I, it feels like the ADA – is very similar to the AODA. Am, am I wrong in um, saying that? It's a little different. It's less. Um, it's less prescriptive than the AODA. The AODA says okay. you have to make the website accessible. You have to make it comply with WCAG 2.1 level AA or 2.0. They may be using. And so, so it's very specific that the content on the website has to be accessible. The ADA is a little more flexible. If there is another way to make it equally effective, then you can use another way. We haven't found another way. And it doesn't, the ADA currently doesn't specify what the, what the standard is for accessibility. So if you found a way other than WCAG 2.1, then you're free to use it. Oh, I see. I see. So, and, and that's why I, I try to correct people when they say, oh, my document isn't ADA. And I'm like, Ugh, <laughs> it's not really the correct terminology because ADA doesn't really have anything in it about document accessibility. Right. It says that you need to have equal access, that you need to treat people equally. Um, but really section 508 or WCAG in itself, you know, is the, the statute that says you must meet 
you know, with th these criteria in your document. So, yeah, for you the know, gov but for I think as entities, a it's different. The, for federal right. government entities, they have to meet Section 508. That ha They have to meet WCAG 2.0. They, they have to. There's no other option for them. And for state and local governments, the Justice Department's putting out a regulation now that will also specify a technical standard for web accessibility. Right. And we have AB um, uh, 1757, AB 434 here in California. Right. And so... I used to work for the California High Speed Rail mm -hmm. and uh, actually in 2016, 17, when it first started rolling out as the mandate for AB 434, they came into our office and knocked on the door and said, okay, everything has to be accessible. And my answer was, who do, who, who knows what that is? And so <laughs> um, <laughs> as somebody with ADHD, I got laser focused on it and it really just became my life's passion after that. Yeah. And, um, you know, kind of led, led us down the road to where we are today. And that's a good point. There are state laws too. Colorado is one that's coming up in June, July, I think. Right? right. You know, so so I think they kind of followed suit after California. Uh, to my knowledge, they're the only two states that have like implicit regulations. Or, or am I mistaken? Do you know, Eve? Yeah, a bunch of states have things that require state government entities to make all their stuff accessible. Texas does. A okay. bunch of places do. Oh. Okay. There's only about 10 different states. We have a slide on this chat in our um, designing with accessibility in mind uh, slide deck. Uh, that's the map of the United States. And there's only, I think, about 10 or 12 uh, states that don't really have any state based legislation on accessibility, uh, at least in some way um, at the at the state level. So I, I should um, have known that since I teach that class. Uh, sorry <laughs> about that. Uh. <laughs> That's OK. We there we have so many slides. I mean, you got to think if you count all of our different classes, oh. and all the different slides we have, I bet we have a thousand slides easily. Wow. So yeah, no worries. No worries. Um, so what I'd like to do as we 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 end our in our interview here, which has been really great, yeah. is to kind of leave people with some of the things that you would recommend that they do to start having that conversation or minimize, yeah. you know, some some easy things they can do to avoid having to come see you at, at, with their day in court. Um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, we'd love to hear you that. Should, you should get your remediation plan going now, ahead of time, before you get a complaint. You should have a way for people to make complaints to you because that's them avoiding a demand letter. And if you do your planning up front and get going on it, take it seriously, monitor it, that's going to save you from having a court tell you that you have to do it faster than you want to. So you want to prioritize the most important things, get your plan going, get remediation happening, and then stop digging. Make sure your content creators know how to make things accessible from the beginning. Then it doesn't cost you anything and you're, and you're not making the problem worse. And, and finally, I would love for you to share some contact information because I know that there are remediation teams and individuals listening right now going, how can I get Eve come to come <laughs> talk to my supervisors <laughs> to tell them from your lips to their ears, um, how do they get a hold of you? Well, I'm at ehill at browngold.com. So ehill at brown like the color, gold like the color dot com. Awesome. So it's been amazing having you on. We really enjoyed this conversation and it's such a long conversation. We could talk about this for another hour easily, but I feel like we've done some good things here. We've talked about what the risk is, how, how, what you can do to help um, ease that process, communicating with your, the individuals who can come onto your website and it's okay to give them a way to complain. Don't be afraid to throw that, to put that contact information out because it helps avoid the whole idea of, right. uh, of going to court. We've talked about some of the legislation that's out there and some of the ways that you can talk to your boss about accessibility and getting that plan, that accessibility plan together ahead of time. I think it's been, been a really good session. So thank you so much for being on the program. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thanks so much, Eve. It's been a pleasure. And uh, we look forward to, to chatting with you again uh, in, in the future. Great. Well, thanks everybody for tuning in today. Uh, once again, uh, we want to thank Tamman, who is sponsoring this podcast. Uh, Tamman's a full service accessibility and technology practice and partners with organizations of all sizes to shift mindsets and empower people. So wherever you are in your inclusive journey, 
Tamman's team can help you with web accessibility assessments and accessible digital solutions. My name is Chad Chilius. And my name is Dax Castro, where each week we unravel accessibility for you. Thanks, guys.